that smoked foods. And the last but not least, the, the one that's, that's kind of the classic example of the field is, is breast cancer in Japanese women. Right? And why does it change so much when they immigrate into Hawaii? No one, no one really understands that. But where you live, what you do, make huge impacts on your risk of cancer. So people have tried to calculate right, what kind of uh, risk does the environment uh, have for you. So, and then they come up with about 75 to 80 percent of cancers in the U.S. are preventable, right? Simply because they are environmentally induced. Okay, and this is just a pie chart trying to give you some idea of, you know, what kind of practices will increase your risk and by how much. Right. Uh, so over here is, is tobacco. Right. So smoking, right, affects your cancer rates tremendously. Right. And you would think, well, it's just the lung. Right? It makes sense, right? You inhale all that smoke. Turns out it affects a lot of different kinds of cancers, not just lung cancer. That's probably where the primary impact is, but it's not the only impact. Right? So that is uh, smoking. Uh, this is diet. You know, what do you eat? Uh, I believe this is alcohol in here. So damage. Your liver, just like that parasite, the liver tries to regenerate, and in doing so, you increase the risk of causing genetic damage, and you increase the risk of having a cancer. All right, over here uh, is uh, reproductive and sexual uh, behavior, right? So that's a pretty good chunk as well. All right? So the take home message out of this, right, is don't eat, don't drink. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, does it? Don't smoke, right? Don't drink. Don't have risky sexual behavior. And Charlie Sheen's going to pay a price in 20 years. <laughs> okay. So those are some of the things that affect your cancer risk. What is cancer, right? A simple, basic definition, right, is uncontrolled cell growth. Whether we're talking about a blood cancer like leukemia and lymphoma, whether we're talking about colon cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma, cancer of the liver, right? It's all pretty much uncontrolled cell growth. Very basic kind of definition, but there's obviously a lot of specifics that we can use to fill in some of those areas. And with that uncontrolled cell growth, how do we achieve that? Well, we cause it, we, we get to that stage by causing changes in the genes of the cell. It's all genetic, it's almost all genetic damage. So having said that, right, that basic definition, the problem is, is that not all cancers are the same on the molecular level. So if we look at the genes that are involved, if we look at the genes that are involved in a leukemia or a lymphoma or a colon cancer, we're going to find a lot of differences between those different types of cancers. So between cancer types, we'll find a variety of genes that have been mutated. It's not all going to be the same. Eh, you know, some are going to be the same, some, but a lot, excuse me, I shouldn't say some, but a lot are going to be different, right? We're also going to find differences between individuals. So that if we take a colon cancer sample from one patient and we compare it to another, right, they don't necessarily have to have or will have the same genetic change. They will have different genes that are damaged. They may share some, but a lot of times they're going to be different. So one thing I'd like to leave you with today is that there's a lot of complexity here. Right? That very simple definition is great. Right? It's a great way to philosophically approach a study of this. Right? But in terms of trying to treat a tumor, this kind of things can, this kind of uh, 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 difference between individuals and between cancer types can wreak havoc, right? Because you develop a drug that's specifically tied to a mutation in a particular gene, it may work beautifully in one individual, and it may totally fail in somebody else. Okay. So this is a problem that's facing pharmaceutical industry. It's a problem facing the whole field. 
So what are these molecular changes? Can we classify them in any sort of way? Well, the molecular changes that allow the cell to escape normal growth control. OK, that makes sense. I just told you that because uh, uh, this was you know, the definition of cancer, loss of growth control. All right. We also have, uh, on top of that, right, that we're going to talk about two genes that are involved in two types of genes that are involved in normal growth control. And that's, that's pretty much the, the basics of where a lot of cancer research goes these days in looking at those kinds of genes. We can also talk about genes that are going to allow an increase in the number of mutations in other genes, right? DNA repair mechanisms, right? Cancer, people like to think of cancer also in a Darwinian aspect. In other words, you have a population of cells in a tumor, right? And it's a race. The cells are racing to see who can proliferate the most, who can overtake the tumor. Whether or not that's a strict Darwinian sense is another matter, but that's the way people look at it. So the idea here is if I'm going to win that race, if I'm going to overpopulate the tumor compared to my little buddy that's sitting next to me, right, I'm probably better off if I mutate more genes and I mutate them faster. I mutate something that acts better to push me through the cell cycle. Or I mutate something or I get rid of something that's going to inhibit me from going through the cell cycle. And if my little buddy doesn't do it, right, I win the race. And that's what we're talking about here. Mutations, cruel of mutations over a period of time. Escape or change normal developmental control. Whoa. If you take a tumor cell early in its stage, Right, early in its development, it can look pretty similar to the normal tissue. But as it accrues more and more changes, and these changes, losses of chromosomes, whole chromosomes can be lost or deleted, portions deleted, portions inverted, huge genetic changes as well as very small ones. Right? We change its developmental control as well. Okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So at the end of the period of looking at a tumor, it can look nothing like the tissue. There are tumors or stages of tumors where the pathologist will come in and he'll look at it, right, and he won't be able to tell the original origin of tissue, tissue origin, excuse me. Right. So the thing's metastasized, it's moved around the body, it's invaded a variety of different tissues, but they can't tell where the original site was from. And why do they want to do that? Well, sometimes the thought is, is that if they know the original site, they may know a better drug regimen to begin the treatment. On top of that, some of these changes will allow the cancer cell to regulate its environment. Okay, we normally think of a tumor as something that's you know, kind of distinct, individual, in a place all by itself. And it really doesn't interact with the other tissue besides to take it over and replace it, right? destroy the tissue that's there. That's not all of what's going on. Right? Turns out it's a little more complex than that. That some of the tissue that it's trying to invade into and take over is actually also being co-opted. That tissue it's being taken over is not being changed in a genetic sense, but it is being changed in a sense that it will produce proteins being caused by the cancer to produce proteins that will help it support the cancer. 